right. People are rejoining from the breakout rooms. We've got about 30 seconds for everybody to get back. So it looks like everybody's just about back now. We'll give them about five seconds. And now everybody should be back in the general session. Hope everyone had a great chance to catch up. Um, glad you all are here. So you know, programs like Sunday Morning Zen are of course free to the, to the public, but um, they're, they're not free to produce. Um, I hope you see the value in ZLMC um, doing programs like Sunday Morning Zen and Commit to Sit. I think they're a wonderful way to stay connected um, at all times, but especially during the time of pandemic. And so um, if they mean as much to you as they do to us, I'd appreciate it if you just take a few moments and uh, consider a donation to ZLMC. You'll notice that in the chat box, there's a, a link to our PayPal account. And it's a very easy way for you to just show your appreciation and help us to continue um, this outreach um, to people uh, with giving them all the programs that, uh, that hopefully you've all come to value very much. So I appreciate your consideration and generosity. Thank you. So this morning, we have someone speaking who I don't think needs much of an uh, introduction. Sensei June is queued up. We're very excited to have her. She's the co-founder of ZLMC and um, the founder of Halau Ikapono, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, our hula school. And she'll be speaking this morning about how lost am I? Uh, sensei, thank you so much. You're muted, Sensei. Thank you. So it is wonderful to be with everyone here. And uh, I saw um, lots of my hula students, which is fabulous because they are going to be dancing at the end of my talk. And I saw some new people here too. Oh, and there's Linda Porter out in England, which is ex exciting. And there were some new people, Michael Starks, a new member which is fabulous. Hi, Michael, and welcome. And I saw another, uh, a few, oh, and there's Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful. Oh, and Stephanie from Santa Cruz. Yay, Stephanie is here. Wonderful to see you. So how lost am I? I want to start with Amanda Gorman's, the very beginning of her poem, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? That the beginning of her very inspirational poem and to me that she was talking about being lost, right? In the shade of a lot of growth where you can't really see, you can't really see where to go, where's the path, it's dark. And it, yes, it has been that kind of a year, that past year of ours, so I was so happy. Uh, last Wednesday when we had the inauguration, it was so uh, hopeful, you know, hope is good, hope, no hope in Zen, they go together, right? Um, but looks like something's changing. And I, I got this title, 
How Lost Am I from this fabulous writing workshop with Natalie Goldberg in November. I think I talked about it once before. She's a writer of 12 books, a long time meditation practice, and she has found that writing for her is a, an essential spiritual path as is meditation, they go together. And she actually has, um, has created these writing retreats that are based on very formal Zen session schedules, which I found wonderful because I love these deep meditation retreats. And then to combine it with something like writing is really amazing because I'm just getting into writing. And yesterday we had a fabulous workshop with Robert Schwock. Um, it was different than, uh, I haven't been to that many writing workshops, but it was different in that he gave us a lot of space and time to write, actually. We meditated, and then there were a couple of hours in the morning to write, which is, you know, interesting to have that kind of freedom and at first I was like, oh, but shouldn't he guide us more? And maybe we should do 10 minute chunks. But I said, no, he's teaching it. I'm just gonna go with it and try it. And it was great. It was so great. Uh, so we're gonna keep doing this, these retreats, meditation, writing retreats, workshops, we call it. But getting back to Natalie Goldberg's uh, writing, uh, workshop that she gave in November. One of the prompts that just came up for her that she said, okay, this is the prompt. How lost am I? And when she gave us that prompt, I initially went, oh no, I don't want to write how lost am I? Even though we don't have to read what we write, but that's interesting, right? I even had problems thinking about writing it down on the page. Now that's interesting. So I noticed, I noticed that resistance and I said, hey, she's the teacher on, and she says her, one of her rules is keep your hand moving and also give yourself permission to write the worst junk in the world. She used the word, uh, the S word. <laughs> Give yourself permission to write the worst shit in the world, basically. So I said, okay, I'm gonna listen to this and I'm gonna write. And it was interesting because after that, because she likes to have people read either in smaller groups or in a big group. And I see Joni Young who was in that workshop there too. She's in my smaller writing group. Welcome from Louisiana. So, uh, what she did was she had she asked people to read to the whole group. And what was interesting was she called on people of color to read. How lost am I? And guess what? I was the first. <laughs> so, uh, so the whole process there was just interesting, right? In Zen, when you come up against something that you don't like, our practice is to pause and to go, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. What are we gonna, what am I gonna do about this? Hmm. That, uh, and I think the practice of meditation helps you to be able to pause and to say, wow, I re I'm really having a strong reaction to this. Why? Well, maybe I can't answer that right now, and that's okay. But I just breathe with it. And so uh, on January 2nd, I hadn't thought of a, a title, uh, but I, um, I had begun this process of these Path of Hula and Zen workshops that have been has been bubbling all through the past year. Well, actually, ever since I started meditating, I've been trying to integrate these two spiritual practices of mine. 
When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? I wanna figure this out. How do I integrate my two practices? You have to wait sometimes. You have to be patient. You have to be lost. Our, our practice of not knowing, right? You have to be okay with that. Yeah, it is where you are at the moment, right? It, it's, it's being yourself, <laughs> right? And so I have um, been practicing that, being myself. Um, especially when I give talks, because, you know, there are many uh, ideas about how you're supposed to be when you give talks, right? You're supposed to be articulate, brilliant. <laughs> and you think, oh, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to get there. And there you are. You've got all that resistance. You've got all that weight, all that thinking that is so habitual, So to be yourself, that is a koan, that is a koan. And uh, the study circle has been finishing up David Brazier's wonderful book, The Dark Side of the Mirror, Forgetting the Self uh, in uh, Genjo Koan, how to do that, how to forget the self. Why do we want to forget the self anyway? It is who we are, isn't it? Who am I? That's another good question with all of the conditioning that we have incorporated into our body. We've forgotten who we are a lot of the times, really forgotten. And I remember who I am when I am sitting Zazen. especially a long, it takes me a long time. So I love session because I can really kind of, you know, cause at first it's like, ah, right? From all the digital media that I'm so addicted to, I can see that. And yesterday, what the neat thing about that was I gave my pers myself permission to not have to like, look at my email so much. I, I looked at it a couple times. <laughs> but how many times are we looking? How many? Social media. I've heard it called digital capitalism. So uh, Brazier says, the underlying message of Genjo Koan, which is Dogen's uh, seminal writing, is identical to what the Buddha said, take refuge and go forth. Okay, what does that mean, take refuge and go forth? Brazier says, taking refuge means living a life of faith in the world as it actually is. Taking, uh, living a life of faith, faith in the world as it actually is. So this has got to mean be yourself. You as you actually are is the practice here. So my meditation practice helps me to awaken and see my true nature, which is part of this huge interconnection of life. This beautiful, beautiful universe that we are a part of. That is who we are. Uh, 
Uh, Shishan Wick gave a fabulous talk on January 2nd, our first talk of the year. He was talking about atonement, which is, um, I like to look at atonement as at one mint, at one mint. And he said, our habit rid ridden consciousness is the most difficult to let go. We can't change the past, but we can change our attitude with attentiveness, with atonement. Greed, hatred, and delusion arise when we feel inadequate in any way. That's a great statement. Greed, hatred, and delusion arise when we feel inadequate in any way. Those are the three poisons in Buddhism that we have to be alert to. We have to be alert to, right? That's our practice, being alert to these three poisons. So we are not ruled by it, by them. And, you know, it's a practice. It is a practice. It's a forgiving practice because we fall off the path and we get lost all the time. I can speak for me. <laughs> so you have to think about it yourself if it's true for you. He said, uh, we take existence for granted. We take our lives for granted and complain when it's not working out like we want. We complain like heck, <laughs> right? Why do we exist? To cultivate a mind of gratitude. Greed and gratitude cannot coexist. So what is the meaning of life? Happiness, I think happiness. But how do you find it? And he said, you find it by bringing happiness to others. Embody happiness. And so we have to let go of this small self to experience the unity and interconnectedness of life. And uh, this self, you know, we hate to let go because we think we're going to be lost. <laughs> I think we should try it, don't you? <laughs> it's a practice. It's a practice to let go of our of this self practice. Again, I wanted to um, thank Ellen Burks for her fabulous talk also, where she was talking about the inner spiritual practices, hers, of Christianity and Zen, that point where they, they intersect. And she said these things that I've been taking to heart. Go deep into your culture and bring forth what's good there and bring it back to benefit people. Depth is of essence in a tradition. It involves meditation, practice, and study with a teacher. We have, to make, we have to have this intention to awaken, right? I want to be more conscious and aware. That's our practice. And, and having self-compassion because we may not be so good at this, especially at the beginning.
and I have to take, accept complete responsibility for how I feel or act. And to not take things personally, that's a practice. Not take things personally. And to be curious, to be curious. There's a, a Chinese saying, one heart, two gates. When you touch the depths, your life opens in two directions. Personal liberation and a need to help the world. So I am grateful for the three seven-day sessions we have here at our center. I look forward to them as a way to decompress and to, do, and to go deep, go deep. And uh, during my, our staycation, actually, one of my hula students, Sarah Evans, was very excited. She said, let's do this aloha challenge. You know, the new year is coming up, aloha meaning love. Let's do this love challenge to bring some self-care into our lives. And, you know, I was on staycation, I was like, oh, do I have to really think about this? And I thought, yes, I have to think about this. And I want to think about this because I know this can help people who are suffering, hula and zen. And so I worked to put together a workshop on January 2nd that we had something like 14 or 15 people attend. About half were Zen people, half were hula people. They were each wanting to learn the other discipline. And then I taught this dance that they're gonna do at the end. Kai Ona means beautiful ocean. She is the goddess in Hawaii of the lost. I was like, this is the dance I have to teach, the goddess of the lost, right? She lives on this mountain, which I can show you pictures of. But before I get there, I wanted to also thank Lori Snyder for sharing to me this book. I know it's backwards, but it is Receiving the Marrow. She is a true librarian. <laughs> she found this <laughs> and uh, gave it to me. And it was perfect for my talk because, let me see, Receiving the Marrow, Teachings on Dogen by Soto Zen Woman, Women Priests. It was published in 2012 or 2013. And the very first chapter was called Dancing the Dharma. Everything's lining up here. <laughs> Thank you, universe. This is exactly what I needed. For those who don't know, Dogen is our founder of the Soto Zen Buddhist sect, sect that we are, we are. And he was the one that went to China and brought Zazen back this practice of deep meditation back for us. And receiving the marrow is, um, it's a story about Bodhidharma. He was the um, pre-monk who brought Buddhism from India to China. And there are many stories about Bodhidharma. He sat facing a wall for nine years without sleeping. I mean, you know, it's kind of amazing. Anyway, when it was time for him to pass, he gave to his four disciples parts of himself. Uh, to one, it was uh, his skin. To another, it was his flesh. To a third, it was his bones. And to the fourth, it was his marrow. 
So I have heard two different stories. I initially remember that he had given the one woman, none, his marrow. But then I read something else where he gave his, the woman his flesh. So anyway, this one is saying, receiving the marrow, and they are commenting on this. And in this chapter, Tejo Munnik, who used to be a Catholic nun, but she left the church when there was all this upheaval, I think uh, maybe in the 60s or so, and she started practicing meditation with uh, Katagiri Roshi in Minnesota, and then was ordained a Zen priest there. And she is commenting on Bendoa, which I think in Commit to Sit, you're gonna be talking maybe about Bendoa, one of Dogen's, I think it's might be his second thing that he wrote. And it's about meditation, it's about Samadhi, because he, you know, initially he was not teaching so much. When he came back, it was, he felt it was such a big responsibility. Anyway, so he wrote it out and Bendoa um, is what he uh, put down for all of us. So um, I'm quoting uh, Tejo here. And so bendo means to carry out the way or to accomplish the way. And Katagiri Roshi said, the way is the path through which not only human beings, but also animate and inanimate beings can walk in peace and harmony together. The way is the path. There's that path again. In other words, she's saying the way is the absolute truth. The absolute truth is the path. Wa means a talk or a story. So bendoa could also mean a story about how to practice the way wholeheartedly, which for my hula students, you know, I want to get to dancing wholeheartedly. Also, living our life wholeheartedly, doing everything wholeheartedly. Uh, Shohaku Okumura translates Bandoa as a talk or discourse about how to practice the way wholeheartedly. Yes, yeah. So, and the subject or heart of Bendoa is Jijuyu Zanmai. Jijuyu Zanmai literally means samadhi of self receiving or accepting its function. Samadhi of self receiving or accepting its function. Or samadhi of self enjoyment or self-fulfillment. Dogen says for all, this is Dogen writing, for all ancestors and Buddhas, practicing upright sitting in Jijuyu Sanmai is the true path for opening up enlightenment. So uh, Dogen says, he describes this zazen, elicits this jijuyu zanmai, which could be understood to mean the experience of receiving and using the joy of samadhi. So we've talked about samadhi before. What is it? So it's usually translated as concentration. But this word can be misleading. Concentration is often understood as something that we do with our minds or thinking we can use our minds as the primary source of awakening. 
This is the opposite of what Dogen was trying to express. Wow, well, if it wasn't the mind, what is it? Right? In terms of prim the primary source of awakening, if it's not the mind, what is it? So Tejo was a dancer as well. She was a, I, I don't know what kind of dance she doesn't really say, but I think modern dance. And so she, she says she first experienced the joy of samadhi through dancing. I know I see some people going, yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Yeah, I get that too. I have experienced samadhi through dancing as well. Uh, she says, experiencing the complete letting go that comes when one completely gives oneself over to the form and to the teacher. She says she definitely has, I definitely have experienced that. In order to perform a dance, one has to first learn the steps, right? All my hula students know this. You have to first learn the steps. After the steps are mastered, the flow of dance begins to emerge. And I think a lot of you have felt this. Um, at this point, resistance arises, can arise, arises. One doesn't yet have a total picture of the dance, but through the steps and the flow, there is a sense of accomplishment, which seems to be enough, which seems to be enough. Then, Weariness sets in and there doesn't seem to be anything else to do. Maybe there is a feeling that going further is beyond the ability of the dancer. So the next part of the process is to continue dancing, to go beyond the resistance and exhaust it. At that point, the dancer becomes the dance and is danced. There is no longer any effort and the dance is perfect. And uh, Tejo says, one of the benefits of studying with a teacher is that by trusting and submitting to the teacher's guidance, Letting go happens. To follow an aspiration is an important component, but if we do it alone, we have only our own experiences to draw from. And because our experiences are limited, it's easy to go in circles. A teacher can help you go beyond your resistance. I can attest to that. So she's saying samadhi is the kind of concentration, concentration in which you absolutely merge. There is no distinction between you and what you are doing. It doesn't mean you go somewhere either. You are right there. You, you, you're being danced, yet you're present. So she says, sometimes samadhi is translated as one pointedness, the means the, uh, which means the ability to stay in touch with and return to the source of awakening. And the source of awakening is reality itself. simply described as impermanence 
and no self. Impermanence is the movement of life, the changing, exchanging, and rearranging that everything in life is doing in every moment. It is simultaneously death and birth, moment by moment. No self, this is a teaching in Zen, describes our relationship with life. There is not a definable self that exists separate from everything else in life. What we call myself is part of and dependent on the life of all things. Being aware of this interconnectedness, we naturally experience the support of everything in life. We naturally experience the support of everything in life. This is what we awaken to and return to in Zazen. And this is called Jijuyu Sanmai. Life is everything and everything is life. Everything is li in life is dependent on everything else. Jijuyu Zanmai is the experience dancing and being danced by life. Dogen includes everything as part of that dance. So practice and enlightenment are not separate. That's what we do when we're sitting on the cushion, we are enlightened, that's why we sit. Jijuyu Zanmai is the complete dance of life in each moment. So, Everything we do is an opportunity for awakening, everything that we do. It's not confined to one thing, awakening. So this brings me to this path of hula again, hula and Zen. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, Kaiona. I'm gonna share my screen. She, I want you to see where she lives. Okay, so she lives here in this beautiful mountain area. See how thick with growth it is? You know, if you are not on the path, you can easily get lost here. And then when you come to clearings, it's clear. And then you're in the midst of this tangling jungle deep. There's a path through a bog. <laughs> and then the other cool thing that I learned is when Kaiona, this great frigate bird over here, here, this beautiful different birds, uh, Kaiona, even though she is deaf and blind, she can hear when people need help and she sends her pet birds. And two of her favorite are the Eva birds. The female has the white here and the males are black. And these Eva birds are incredibly um, incredible birds. They can soar for two to four months without touching the ground. They cannot submerge. So they have to catch fish like eagles do 
you know, with their feet, or they can jostle other birds who have just caught a fish so they'll release what they caught and eat it. They can soar up to two and a half miles high easily go through 300 miles a day of just soaring. And the evas are her favorite birds, right? Because the eva can see, can you can see the eva and the eva will help you get back on the path. So, um, So I like to uh, really, when we're studying a dance, really look at the lyrics and um, so we know what we're dancing, right? So we can really be one with the dance. So this uh, dance has got four verses and a refrain in it. It's a story, we are dancing the story. The first verses, the all the first three verses are all about being lost. Why? Well, the first line, wandering astray in the highlands. Yeah, that could be at the top of the mountain, but it could also be here in our mind because of so many distractions, right? A wandering mind is an unhappy mind is what a study out of Harvard, uh, Matt Killingsworth said. You know, if you're not focused and you're just full of stuff in your head, you can easily get lost. And so it's saying, wandering astray in the highlands through the tangling forest deeps, drawn here by the perfumed scent, following the desires of the heart. Right? So many distractions, so many beautiful things. It's just, you know, we're just. Too many, too many. The second verse is saying, urged onward by the blossoms, right? Beauty, like a bird, we are going toward the flowers by the entrancing beauty. And we're looking here and we're looking there. So fickle is our heart, mind, our ego, fickle. And then the refrain, grant knowledge, share the insight. O beloved Kai Ona, goddess of the lost, let the pathway be pointed out, which will lead directly there, directly here. Let the pathway, we know usually what the pathway is if we can just open to it. The third verse is saying, those promontories with clear vistas and dark forested veil, the going can be slippery and uncertain. Such are entanglements of the heart. So we are dancing this story of being lost. And then the fourth verse is saying, but the sweet essence ever issues forth, always bringing a deep stirring within, right? Like a flower. Uh, I saw this beautiful quote by Jean-Paul Richter. Flowers never emit so sweet and strong a fragrance as before a storm. When a storm approaches thee, be as fragrant as a sweet smelling flower. And so the ends, the story is known in the telling of the bright sparkle of the heart, right? It is about this bright sparkle. It's always there, we have it. So I want to close this formal part of the talk with Amanda Gorman's, her last li few lines of her poem. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. 
the new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I'm just those lines, you know, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So this is the sparkle in our heart that just pervades the universe because it is part of the universe. It is the universe. So with that, I'm going to ask everybody who is not a hula, who's not dancing, to turn off your video, stop your video. And also, if you go to those three dots next to uh, mute, um, you can um, also, um, you know, you can kind of um, eliminate you, your screen even from the, um, the gallery here. All right, so. <clears throat> so this beautiful song was written by Puakea Nogelmeyer, who is actually not Hawaiian, but he loves Hawaiian as a translator. He speaks fluent Hawaiian. And um, <clears throat> it is sung by a very, very uh, popular singer in Hawaii, Kealii Raichel. Uh, singing Kaiona. And I have my hula dancers here dancing. I've also started a chair hula class, which is fabulous. Um, and, uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so. Uh, so great to see all these hula dancers here. Yay. Okay, here we go. I am going to, and I'm going to um, mirror this dance. So I'll be dancing in an opposite direction, but it, it helps the dancers. So uh, to all be going in the same way. All right, so here 